and welcome to a special edition of AAU Talks. And AAU Talks is a flagship program of the Association of African Universities, AAU, the voice of higher education in Africa. And I'm here at the Coconut Groove Hotel in Elmina, in the central region of Ghana, to talk about leaders and misleaders. And if I say leaders, you know who I'm talking about. I'm going to interview one of the illustrious sons of Africa. He's a much sought after motivational speaker, cast in the mode of Madiba Nelson Mandela, the Julius Nyerere's, and Kwame Nkrumah. You can follow this discussion on all our social media handles on the screen and on our dedicated website, tv.aau.org. I am the sitting host for this program. My name is Ransom Bequin. I will introduce the guests when we return from this short break. Are you an institution or individual? Do you intend to organize a memorable event to be archived for future reference? Then look no further than AAU Studios because it's your best bet. With our spacious studio and state-of-the-art media equipment such as 4K Panasonic video cameras, Kinoflow lights, assorted microphones, live streaming machines and others, you are sure to get the best of production. Visit us at Trinity Avenue, East Legon, adjacent the National Accreditation Board or contact the AAU studio via the following addresses. Info at aau.org, aautv at aau.org, Ransford at aau.org. Alternatively, you can call us on 0244-185-998 or plus 233. 24473-6280. Welcome back from the break. This is AE Talks, and AE Talks is the flagship program of the Association of African Universities. Just before the break, I had introduced the topic of this special edition of AE Talks, which is leaders and misleaders. And to do justice to the program is no other but Professor Patrice L. O. Lumumba. Prof, welcome to Ghana. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you very much Thank for coming much. and honoring our invitation yes. to talk to you on a very pertinent topic, leaders and misleaders, as you put it. Yes. What brings you to Cape Coast? I'm here to talk to my fellow Africans at the, at the University of Cape Coast on the subject of leadership in Africa and to interrogate where Africa should be going forward. And this is an occasion, as I say many times, of cross-fertilizing and cross-pollinating ideas as we look to a bright future for the continent and the peoples of Africa. Good. Uh, Africa's development challenge is not so obvious for the blind to even see. And if it is, why do we even need leaders to lead the development agenda? All the more reason why we need leaders. It is true that Africa has had a troubled past. It is true that Africa continues to meet many headwinds in our quest for socio-economic and political development. But we must also remind ourselves that Africans were traumatized through the enslavement project, through the colonization project, and through the neo-colonial project. But when you look at Africa very keenly, in the first few years after independence, it cannot be denied that we had leaders who were focused, leaders who were clear about the direction that the continent ought to take. But that was rudely interrupted. And after that rude interruption, the history of Africa is one that may be described as a potpourri of the sweet and sour. Mm. The story of the stories, not just a single story, the stories of famine, the stories of war, the stories of underdevelopment, the stories of uh, low, inf high infant mortality, maternal mortality, and all other indices that undermine the growth of Africa. But I'm not one who is just about to write Africa's obituary. I'm one who believes that this continent is capable of realizing her potential, not through pronouncements, but if we roll up our sleeves and begin to do the right thing. And this must be done through sound and focused leadership. So who should provide this leadership? Is it the African Union or is it individual governments in the various states of Africa? 
Many times when we talk about Africa, we talk about her as if she was one country in the same manner in which we talk of the United States of America, we talk of China. But remember that Africa, unfortunately, is divided into 54 officially recognized countries, each with a historical baggage that she was bequeathed to her by the colonizers. Yeah. So you have the countries that were colonized by the British, by the French, by the Portuguese, by the Belgians, by the Spaniards, and all these dead weight still continues to weigh down Africa. And therefore, in a short answer to your question, there is a need for Africa or African countries at the individual level to focus and orient their development in a direction that will help their peoples. But our division is a weakness. And that is why over the years African countries have tried to propel themselves through different avenues of unity. You remember at the very beginning of the decolonization process as early as 1963 and uh, the inspiration of individuals such as Kwame Nkrumah, uh, Julius Kambarage Nyerere and uh, uh, Kenneth Kaunda, the organization of African unity was created. Initially it was meant to be a body that would gel together the African countries and it was in the forefront of the decolonization process. This in itself was an acknowledgement that African unity was critical. After that, we have had very many initiatives. The Lagos Plan of Action in 1980, which was designed to ensure that Africans traded within Africa and that we de-emphasized our linkage with the Western world. Recently, we have seen other initiatives such as Africa Agenda 2063 and the Africa Continental Free Trade Area and the regional efforts in ECOWAS, in SADAC, in East African Community, in Central Africa, in the Maghreb, in Central Africa, sending one clear message that divided we may be, but we recognize that our lifeline lies in our unity as a people. And that is why I think that going forward, going forward rather, an integrated approach to leadership is what will save Africa from her perennial problems. But looking at the various interests that individual countries have, for instance, having common markets, mm -hmm. having a common currency, you know, individual African countries may feel that they lose their sovereignty when, when they give out some of the powers that they have. Do you think that the achievement of the Africa we want by the year 2063 is a reality? You know, <laughs> this thing called sovereignty, I, I, I think it is Julius Nyerere who spoke about it on the sixth day of March in 1997 in Accra, Ghana. He was talking about African unity and he said, that we must de-emphasize our Tanzanian-ness, we must de-emphasize our Ghana-ness, and we must emphasize our African-ness because divided we are weak and incapable of realizing our goals. And this thing called sovereignty, what is its value if we cannot feed ourselves? What is its value if it only massages the egos of egotistical and megalomaniacal leaders. Leadership is about improving the quality of people's lives, whether they are in Bangui, in Central African Republic, or Banjuli in the Gambia, or they are in uh, Eswatini in Southern Africa, or Maseru in Lesotho. People want food on the table. Yes. People want portable water, people want good health care, people want sound education, people want opportunity to innovate and to invent and employment opportunities. And if those can be improved by breaking down these artificial boundaries that were imposed on us in Berlin, so be it. And therefore the class of leaders that Africa needs are individuals who recognize that going forward, they must be servant leaders who do what is in the best interest of the majority of the peoples of Africa.
Talking about servant leadership, do you, what are the critical characteristics of a very good political leader? A, a servant leader, a good leader, is one who recognizes that the position of leadership is one of honor and privilege. Right. And that his or her duty is to marshal the ship of state in a direction that will benefit the people. He is an individual who recognizes that he or she does not have the monopoly of knowledge and that he has just been honored to be the first amongst equals he or she must be a visionary. He or she must desire to improve the quality of the lives of the people that he has the honor and privilege of serving. He must not suffer from what I call the Jehovah complex, the belief by backward individuals in position of leadership that they have the monopoly of wisdom. Okay. Well, now let's talk about leadership in individual countries. From your tour of continental Africa, have you identified good leaders and have you identified bad leaders? The continent of Africa is very diverse. The continent of Africa has many challenges and in the recent past I've traveled to quite a number of African countries and observed attempts by individuals in political leadership to change the lives of their people. Right. There is no unanimity, and I believe that there are people who will not agree with me on this, but I have noticed in a number of countries deliberate attempts at doing the right things. Mm. I've seen that in Rwanda, despite their shortcomings. I've seen that in Tanzania, despite their shortcomings. I've seen that in Ethiopia despite their shortcomings. I've seen that in Botswana despite their shortcomings. I've seen that in Namibia despite their shortcomings. I've seen that in Ghana. When I came here several years ago, I talked about doom so, doom so. Yes. That is now <laughs> largely in the past. Okay. I've seen sound and good pronouncements meant to improve the quality of the lives of the people. I'm not saying that these individuals are doing things that will change their countries dramatically, but to the extent that they recognize that what is in the best interest of the people is what must be done, they are to be encouraged. They are to be criticized sometimes so that they are helped and egged along but they must be reminded that they must have their eyes on the ball at all times. Thanks. Okay, you have mentioned a few countries, mm. Namibia, you've mentioned mm. uh, Botswana, Rwanda, and Ghana. Yes. Do you think that African leaders need mentorship? And if they do, where should they be mentored? Within Africa or out of Africa? First of all, let me say that uh, those are some of the few countries that I've mentioned. There may be quite a number of other countries which are doing good things here and there. But I believe that uh, leadership is about humility. And when individuals are humble, then they learn. Right. They learn from others who have uh, been in similar positions or others who have uh, thought about those positions. And that is why leaders have advisors. The whole idea of having advisors is a recognition that you do not have monopoly of knowledge. So you go to economic advisors. Right. These are individuals who advise you on the basis of experience and learning that if you are to achieve the agenda that you have declared, this is the way to go. You have advisors on health. You have advisors on governance. This is something that ought to be done ever so frequently. And in countries where they are fortunate enough to have retired leaders, mm. those constitute a reservoir of exactly. knowledge that you can draw from from time to time. And they will be able to tell you that we made mistakes here. Mm -hmm. Don't repeat the same mistakes. In Ghana here, for example, Splendid. I believe that President uh, Nana Kufuado should occasionally talk to President, former President Mahama should occasionally talk to President uh, Jerry Rawlings yes. because in that way they are able to guide. If you go to Namibia, 
there is wisdom in uh, uh, President Hage Gengob going occasionally to President Ifike Punye Pohamba in Botswana. There is wisdom in ensuring that uh, Masisi talks to Kwet Masire in Kenya. President Kenyatta should talk to President Moi and Kibaki. And there are other leaders who have also been in power for a long time, such as my good friend Yoweri Kaguta Museveni. They mm. have made mistakes, they have done certain things right. People can go and talk to them. There is no shortage of people who can be consulted. In Nigeria, for example, if uh, President Buhari has a problem, there is President Obasanjo, Abdul Salim, uh, there are many others. And I think this is what one may describe as mentorship. Right. So do you subscribe to the notion that we should have a think tank? Oh, without doubt. All right. And I believe that any leader worth his or her salt has a duty to deliberately create linkages with men and women in academia. Right. The institutions of higher learning constitute a very useful reservoir, and universities should indeed constitute think tanks mm. which think through national policies, which interrogate national programs, mm. which go out and advise presidents and tell them that these are the things that have been tried and tested and if you change them in a manner that is responsive, uh, responsive to our uh, circumstances, then our country will leapfrog some of the difficulties that other countries have. The, one of the weaknesses we have in Africa is that we don't have uh, think tanks. Well, we don't uh, use individuals who have ideas. Yeah. And people think that when people have ideas, then they threaten their leadership position. African leaders must, in the nature of things, begin to do that. It pains me when I see retired European leaders coming to Africa and thinking that they have the monopoly of knowledge and wisdom oh. and telling our presidents what to do, what to do. while we have men and women in Africa who can do that and do it well and do it in a manner that is appreciative of the African circumstances. I will not name names, but you know that uh, some former heads Head of, of state in, in Europe and America are now hopping from one African capital to the other, being paid millions of dollars and millions of CDs and millions of Nairas to advise us. Advise us on what? Mm. We we'll talk about yeah. education and leadership when we return from the break. Thank you. We are going on a short break, and I've been talking to Professor Patrice Lumumba on leaders and misleaders. We are going on this short break, and when we come back, we're going to talk about the educational leadership in Africa. Stay tuned. This is Africa's most friendly nation, Ghana. A warm reception awaits you in an environment where you can discover and harness your full potential. Your home is an academic haven lying northeast of the city center, a quick dash from the airport. A spirited community where young, vibrant minds are empowered to express themselves, break academic boundaries, and thrive in an atmosphere of rich cultural heritage and excellence in various collegiate and extracurricular activities. This institution represents a whole new world of fun and offers you a variety of activities, facilities and services geared towards your total development. Believing in the uniqueness of all our students, we encourage them to pursue excellence in integrity. Welcome to the University of Ghana, your preferred academic destination. Welcome back from the break. This is AAU Talks on AAU TV. You are following the discussion on leaders and misleaders on our social media handles on the screen and on our dedicated website tv.aau.org. Before the break, I have been talking to Professor Lumumba on leadership in Africa. And now we are going to delve into leadership in our higher education institutions. Prof, universities are established to help promote developmental agenda. But Africa has over 2,000 accredited higher education institutions. But Africa continues to have challenges. 
Are universities relevant? Universities will always remain relevant. You will remember one of the things that African political leaders declared at the time of independence was that we had to give pride of place to education. Initially, it was to address the problems of literacy and numeracy. Right. And universities were created. The few that we inherited were dedicated to training a new cadre of individuals who would aid the countries in different sectors. This is how you understood, for example, here in Ghana, when President Krumah was uh, talking about the University of Ghana at Legon, the University at Winneba, the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, the University of Cape Coast a little later, and you talked about Fura Bay in yes. Freetown, yes. University of uh, Nigeria in Legon yes. being yes. given pride of place, University of Lagos, University of East Africa at Makerere, yes. Dar es Salaam and Nairobi, and uh, quite a number of institutions. It, if it was not Nukuruma saying it in Ghana, it was Nyerere saying it in, in, in Tanzania, Ahmed Ben Bella saying it in Nigeria, in, in, in Algeria, there was unanimity. And if you look at the early days of the universities, there was clarity. If it was in the schools or faculties of engineering, we were bringing out engineers who would help us in building our infrastructure, doctors who would man our hostels, uh, lawyers who would deal with the judicial arm, and, and all those things. And I want to submit that indeed universities have remained critical. The only problem that has been bedeviling our institutions of higher learning is inadequate funding. Over the years, many university administrators will tell you that govern, governments do not put premium on research and development. Exactly what I was going to drive at. Yes. Because if you look at the Lagos <laughs> Plan of Action yes. of 1980, yes. African governments are to commit 1% yes. of their GDP yes. to research and development. Correct. But African governments, even the current ones, are still not committing to research and development. Is it not a situation whereby they shelve the responsibility of universities to the background? You know, on paper and at the level of rhetoric, you'll hear the political leaders saying how important the universities are. But when it comes to commitment, particularly in terms of funding, then very little funds are given to the universities. The net effect, therefore, is that many universities in Africa are not engaged, as we have agreed, on research and development. Mm -hmm. And when you don't get research and development given priority, it means that there is no innovation, yes. it means that there is no invention, mm -hmm. it means that you are slowly converting universities into glorified high schools. Mm -hmm. And that is very dangerous. Yeah. The net effect is that the quality of the men and women that you then produce and unleash into the job market and into industry are men and women who are not well equipped with the knowledge, cutting edge knowledge. So the message that must be sent to government, mm. I know that many African governments can barely deal with very, very uh, secondary issues, or rather primary issues such as uh, 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 financing health, financing primary education, feeding yeah. the people. So that when you talk about funding research and development, they think that those are luxuries which yeah. they can ill afford to focus yeah. on if they are to deal with much more mundane yeah. issues. Yeah. But what they do not recognize, that if you fund your institutions of higher learning, then they will be able to produce. And when they be able to produce and generate ideas, then they'll solve the problems that are affecting you. Mm. If it is public health, yeah. the schools of medicine will deal with public, public health, health issues. If it is the question of, uh, of literacy and numeracy, the universities will be able to do that. If it is in the question of production of food, then the faculties of agriculture right. will improve agriculture. Mm. It is that linkage that must be established so that the political class are able to see this. And they just need to ask countries such as India. They need to ask countries such as China. They need to ask Europe and the United yeah. States of America yeah. and lately a few countries in, in Latin America. And they will recognize that the universities are at the very heart 
of economic and social development of any country. Ignore universities, then you begin to go on a downward spiral. Should we say that African leaders have ignored universities? Can we not shift the blame on lack of innovative university leaders who would then pick up the mantle and then move their universities from the relegated background that governments have given them into more entrepreneurial roles? You know, this is a paradox, a paradox in the sense is that when you talk to your typical university administrator, particularly public universities, the truth is that they depend on government financing. Right. The truth is that governments also have this obligation or feel that they have this obligation to provide education at subsidized levels so that your university chancellor and the university administrators will tell you that in order to train a doctor, we possibly need one million CDs per semester. But right. the government will tell you, no, that is a political question. Hmm. You can only charge 100,000 CDs. So that everybody knows that the cost of financing education ought to be at this level. But because it is a political question, you pretend to be subsidizing. The net effect is that the university that suffers and quality that suffers. So I'm one who is very slow to condemn or to accuse the university administrator who finds himself or herself between the rock and the hard place and for that reason cannot do what he or she desires. Compare that to private universities in the United States which charge at a premium and therefore are capable of raising funds internally to fund education. They're in a totally different space. and. That space is one that is not easy to occupy in Africa where incomes are low, where the expectations are that the government have a duty to, 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 to offer education free and governments are also not doing very well and therefore have very thin budgets and are incapable of funding these critical areas. Mm. So it's a combination of factors in okay. Africa. Well, we are wrapping up, but <laughs> yeah. a question that has just come to mind. Yes. Will you subscribe to the notion mm -hmm. that university leaders mm -hmm. should necessarily be academics? Universities are academic institutions. Right. And therefore, at the critical levels of university leadership, you need academics. But academics must be supported by administrators who are specially trained to help them achieve their academic ambitions. I'm one who would be very wary to bring somebody who is an academic to be at the helm of a university, in, in a university. My view is have the academics who are in positions of leadership trained to offer leadership and have men and women who are trained to be administrators to be specifically sharpened for providing support services to these academics. Mm. Finally, what role can universities play in projecting and promoting the Africa we want, that is Agenda 2063. The universities are, are critical in this agenda. But the issue <laughs> is that the universities don't seem to know about Agenda 2063. If they don't know, then I'm very sad. I hold the view that universities in every part of Africa should now have courses that begin to unpack Africa Agenda 2063. I believe that universities should be in the space where they are able to unpack Africa continental free trade area. I believe that there should be special modular courses that are taught in regions that are telling us about ECOWAS and talking about the economic agenda of ECOWAS, the economic agenda of East African community, the economic agenda of the Maghreb, of Central Africa, of SADAC, of COMESA, and IGAD. Mm. And if they are not doing that, this is the time. Otherwise, they become ivory towers which have no relevance to the society. In other words, I think and believe that there should be a connect umbilical cord between the universities and what is happening in Africa mm. because it is at the universities where these things will be refined and unpackaged and articulated in a manner that will have practical meaning when we are talking about the elimination of tariff and non-tariff barriers mm. how are we going to deal with them mm. I believe and hold the view 
that when we are beginning to talk about Africa continental free trade area, yeah. whose secretariat is, will be is in Accra, Ghana, yes. we must now begin to recruit deliberately people from universities so that when we begin to come up with the protocols to the SCTFA, we will involve universities. This idea that universities are apart from the society, that universities are apart from what is happening at the African Union, this is one of the things that is drawing us back. Mm. The universities must now claim their space and governments must allow them to claim that mm. space so that they are part of the agenda. That is what is happening in Europe. That is what is happening in different places. If you look at some of the things that happened in Africa in the 1980s during the structural adjustment program, yeah. you will discover that it's American universities which were behind what was called the Washington Consensus. Right. The role that universities such as Harvard played, the role that universities such as Oxford played, the role of universities such as the University of Ghent or Free University of Brussels, or any other, and other universities in Europe and America was to provide the intellectual push. And when they provide the intellectual push, they are able to ensure that political practitioners have sound intellectual cushioning in terms of decision making. Mm. Yeah. Prof, there is a very wise saying that yeah. a good conversation yes. never ends. <laughs> and if we want to continue with this discussion, yes. we are going to spend a whole day here. You end when it is sweetest. <laughs> <laughs> but I know you have other engagements today, yes. and we are going to still follow you yes. in your delivery on leadership yeah. at the university campus. Thank so you. we thank you very much for thank granting you very us much this space on AAU TV.